Today we make an attempt to know something about international institutions. When we take into consideration international institutions, first and foremost, we as students of international law, we should know something about the League of Nations and its successor, the United Nations and the other subsidiary organs that function under the auspices of the United Nations system. Now, students naturally would like to know what exactly are the history of the development of international institutions, whether these institutions were developed only the first League of Nations or a replica of it was there prior to the establishment of the League of Nations. Now we go to the time of the Greeks as well as the Romans. It was the Greeks for the first time established the office of council and it was continued and perpetuated and improved and refined by the Romans. Now when we take into consideration the office of the council for the first time came in during the time of the Greek city-states to protect the trade interest of the city of Greece in a foreign country. Now the council was appointed to take care of the property of its nationals in foreign ports. Thereafter, he went on asserting certain rights and these rights at a later stage became customary rules of international law. As I mentioned to you, it was continued throughout the civilization at a later stage, including the Romans. Now, thereafterwards, another important development took place, and this development, important development, happened to be the office of the ambassadors. Now, the office of the ambassador was created by the sovereign, and this person, who was the representing the person of the sovereign was appointed only for, for a purpose of negotiating treaties. Later, the office of the ambassador became an institution itself. Now, you might be knowing today, you have a convention, 1961 convention on the Vienna Convention of the Diplomatic Privileges and Immunities. Simultaneously, we have a convention on the consular privileges and immunities. This is how the international law relating to international institutions originated. Now, when we come to the 17th century, you might be knowing the Treaty of Westphalia was signed. Most of the scholars in international law go to the extent of pointing out the Treaty of Westphalia of 1648, ending with the conclusion of the 30 years war was a major important development in the progress and development of international law. Now, this actually made the members of the international community to have an international institution, at least in the future. Now, but then, there were other rulers in the country, especially in Europe. King Podibard of Bohemia now suggested that there should be an institution or association of states. And later, another great scholar in international law by name Sully, who was a minister in a court, pointed out, it is not only an international institution, but there should be a center for arbitration. So in the event of a dispute between states, naturally, the dispute shall be referred to this court of arbitration, was his expression. Now, thereafterwards, here and there, when the wars broke out, and when the wars concluded, members of the international community were thinking that international institutions are very much essential. But then, the real task of establishing an international institution came in in the year 1815. You might be knowing, Napoleon Bonaparte, the ruler of the state of France, was defeated uh, at the Battle of Waterloo. And after his defeat, he was taken to the island of Helena and then he passed away in the year 1821. But then soon after the Battle of Waterloo, members of the international community thought of having some kind of institution. But then the differences between the states were such, the sovereignty or the hangover of sovereignty between each of them, each of the rulers who concluded the Treaty of Vienna was such, they could not come for a compromise and prepare to give 
anything. They wanted to take everything but did not give anything. In the situations of this nature, nothing happened and afterwards we come to the year 1914. Now we speak about the year 1914, the First World War began. And after the First World War, when it began, it was started by the state of Germany. The aggrandizement of the state of Germany led to the First World War. But then the First World War naturally had to come to an end and it came, in, came to an end in the year 1919. Now members of the international community, especially led by the state of the United States, wanted to have an international institution. You might be knowing President Woodrow Wilson. He was the architect, what we call as architect of the Treaty of Versailles of 1919. Now the Paris Treaty, which was signed there, was part of the Treaty of Versailles creating the League of Nations. Thus, remember, the League of Nations came to be established. When the League of Nations came to be established, it was an international organization. And it was an organization and members of the international community thought that they would abide by it. They would abide by it for the simple reasons they wanted peace as well as security. Always remember, peace and security is very much essential even at the national level. And moreover, in, in order to have a free intercourse between states, we should have peace and security at the international level as well. For four years, the devastating effects which was caused by the First World War, the suffering of the human beings that caused, the use of chemical weapons here and there, caused during the course of the First World War, was enough of a memory for the citizens of states and they wanted to have the League of Nations. Now the League of Nations was actually uh, drafted by the United States under Woodrow Wilson. Now this Woodrow Wilson, although he was responsible in drafting the League of Nations, he wanted to become a party as well. But then when he wanted to become a party to the League of Nations, the Senate of the United States rejected it. They rejected it for the simple reason that if we become a party, we are becoming a party to entangling alliances. The state of the United States was not prepared and not prepared to accept to become a party to entangling alliances. That is where a great scholar on European history by name, Professor E. Lipson points out, the founding father of the League of Nations was without honor in his own country. However, the League of Nations had great objectives. In order to maintain peace and security, they introduced what we call as the collective security mechanism for the first time. You may be interested to know what is collective security. Collective security is simply meant all against the aggressor. That is the translation. Collective security. If a particular person or a particular state declares war, in the event of the declaration of war by a particular state, by violating rules of international law, all the remaining states should join together and defeat that concerned state and tow it to the line of peace. That is the meaning of collective security. Now in the, the League of Nations, the principle of collective city was endorsed. But then each member was given the freedom to determine whether the concerned state has violated rules of war, indulged in an act of aggression, perpetrated miseries to the people, had to be decided by the individual state itself. Now the League essentially had three organs. When I speak about the three organs, the first one is the League Assembly. Now the League Assembly composed of members who are from different quarters and they became members of the League of Nations and tried to accept and carry out the principles of the League of Nations. Now the second one is the League Council. Now the League Council is just like a replica of the present Security Council of the United Nations. They had huge powers and these powers were exercised by the League. And then the third one, the Secretariat. The Secretariat is an office to run the day-to-day -day administration of the Office of the League of Nations. So the League Assembly, the League Council and the League Secretariats were, Secretariat were the three important organs of the League of Nations. Now, the, what exactly 
are the success of the league, achievements of the league. And when I speak about the achievements of the league, remember Professor Edward Thompson, a great historian, points out, the League of Nations is actually an improved version of the several attempts which were made by states to have an international institution. So that way, that way, for the first time, an international institution came to be established and that institution has functioned successfully. Now, when we take into consideration the first plus points of the League of Nations, now the League of Nations has done tremendous work. When I speak about the tremendous work, remember there were uh, instances relating to dispute between the state of United Kingdom as well as the state of Turkey, that is the Mosul boundary dispute. And the League of Nations was able to successfully resolve this dispute. There was, there was another dispute between the state of Finland as well as the state of Sweden regarding the Aland Island case. It is an important case. The Aland Island dispute was resolved by the League of Nations, the League Council, very successfully. There were differences between the uh, state of Belgium as well as the state of Germany. And these differences were resolved by the League of Nations. Simultaneously, there were differences between the state of Bulgaria as well as the state of Poland. And these disputes were resolved successfully by the League of Nations. It is to the credit of the League of Nations. In the formative periods, especially in the initial period, the League of Nations was able to resolve itself to maintain international peace and security. That is why the success of the League of Nations in a few cases which I have just mentioned and there are many other cases as well. Now the second important development that has taken place happened to be the uh, Peace of Paris, Pact of Paris of 1928. The Pact of Paris which is popularly called as the Briand and Kellogg Pact. And the Briand and Kellogg Pact which was entered in the year 1928 was a great attempt which was done for the first time. You may be interested to know the Briand and Kellogg Pact for the first time renounced war as an instrument of national policy. Earlier, for flimsy reasons, states would go to war. But then the parties to the war and the parties who are parties to the Briand and Kellogg Pact for the first time renounced war as an instrument of national policy. It was actually a feather on the cap of uh, the cap of the League of Nations for resolving uh, or entering into such a treaty in 1928. Now there afterwards, uh, there were several other developments that have taken uh, place as well. The League of Nations for the first time adopted a convention uh, on slavery. Anti-slavery convention was adopted in 1926. And a permanent convention, a permanent commission on slavery was adopted by the League of Nations in the year 1932. And the League of Nations, although has done uh, these uh, things, it has, remember, believed in humanitarian assistance. And humanitarian assistance is being given to almost all the members of the League of Nations. And it is being uh, part of the recorded history. The League honestly and sincerely served its objectives until 1932. Now, for the first time, a disarmament conference was convened by the League of Nations and the states at the disarmament conference when it was convened were, remember, instead of discussing the basic issue of dis disarmament, lost in the met metaphysics of armament. In such a situation, the conclusion, remember, remained uncontested, uh, but then nothing was achieved at the conference. Now, many of the scholars who attended the disarmament conference represented by states went to the extent of arguing disarmament is not possible without security and security cannot be attained without disarmament. In such a situation, when the discussion was taking in that shape, nothing was concluded and it came to an end. Now, how did such an organ fail? The League had a transcendental failure. 
It had a transcendental failure for one or two important reasons which we will know. One important reason is, in 1932, Japan invaded Manchuria. And not only it invaded Manchuria, part of the Chinese territory, and it installed a government there. And when the question came up before the League Council, Japan carried two hoots for the League Council members. It walked out in protest and resigned from the League of Nations. That is the starting point of the death of League of Nations. So the League was not in a position to do anything because Japan resigned and went. For the first time, the League had to digest illegal occupation by Japan or the state of Manchuria and the installation of a government at its behest. But the second important thing that has taken place in the year 1935. In the year 1935, uh, the state of Italy, led by Mussolini, conquered Abyssinia. And when he conquered a portion of the state of Abyssinia, and later full Abyssinia, remember, notice was given to the Italian ruler Mussolini. When notice was given to the Italian ruler Mussolini, he said the action which was completed is irrevocable and irreversible. He was not prepared to withdraw the army. There came the death of the League of Nations. Now a few years later, in one or two years later, what has happened was, the mother of all democracies, that is the state of Great Britain, gave actually, in the, in the initial beginning, the de facto recognition to the areas which, are, which was occupied by Italy. And ultimately, it was recognized de jure by the state of England. Now, in the year 1936, another instance took place, and this instance happened to be an instance relating to oh, the state of Spain. The fight between the insurgents on the one hand and the nationalist governments. Now, the insurgents were taking part day by day the territory of the state of Spain, and there were the de jure rulers who were legally appointed rulers who were trying to control the remaining territory which is uh, occupied by them. Now, in such situations, the state of Great Britain uh, devised a new formula to facilitate and protect its trade. The areas which are occupied by the rebels or the revolutionary forces was given de facto recognition by the state of Great Britain. And the areas which were occupied by the state of Spain was given de jure recognition. And at a later stage, everything, when Spain became independent, you know, when the revolutionaries have taken over the entire territory, it was given the de jure recognition. Now, these were all, remember, not in good taste and not completely in agreement with the established rules of international law. This was done only for the sake of protecting itself and to protecting its people to protect the international trade and the trade of the state of Great Britain in those countries. In such a situation, remember, war was inevitable and declaration of war naturally took place. When the state of Great Britain grave de jure and recognition to the Italian occupation of Abyssinia. Remember the case came up before the parliament of the state of Great Britain. Now the Clement Ackley was the prime minister of the state of Great Britain. And Clement Ackley was the prime minister and the parliament after discussing, just remember, shouted at Ackley and made him to leave and invited Winston Churchill and then he became the Prime Minister of the State of England, and then the war was a complete blown war. That is what we call it the Second World War. Now, why did the League fail? Now, the League has failed because there are three, three important reasons that are being given by scholars. Now, one important reason is the absence of the State of United States. Now, United States was not, in, was not part of the League of Nations. And since it was not part of the League of Nations, the League was dominated by two powerful states, the state of France as well as the state of England. Now, the state of France as well as the state of England did not accept or honor, in a few cases, the sentiments of other members of the League of Nations. It led to slackness by 
a, or a slack approach by the other members of the League of Nations. This is one of the important re reasons that is being approved. Now there were the loss of great European leaders. You might be knowing there was a great leader by name Briand. Now Briand happened to be a leader from the state of France. And in the year 1932 itself he said, European countries should come together. There should be a union Europe. But then this approach or the, what we call as the formula which was put by Mr. Briand, uh, remember could be materialized only in 1950 under the auspicious United Nations. The great Briand passed away in 1932. After his death, there were no other leaders who were in a position to take shape and a position to maintain international peace and security. Most of them were weak in such inhospitable climate. League had to fail and it failed and it had its natural death. Now the third important development happened to be the dictatorial attitude of three states, the state of Germany, the state of Italy and the state of Japan. All of them were incorrigible states. And these incorrigible states were not prepared to accept what we call as the suggestions which are indicated under the League of Nations. And the League died and the Second World War broke out. A great writer uh, by name, Professor H. L. Fisher, in his history, history of Europe points out, one of the reasons which was responsible for the League of Nations the, is the decline of moral power over the mechanical power. Moral power was degrading and nobody was in a position to restore it. No person took the effort, remember, to restore the moral power and the mechanical pro progress was going on swiftly and swiftly and in such circumstances war was natural and it took place. And this is in a sense something relating to the League of Nations. Now when we go further, we go to the establishment of the United Nations. Uh, how did the United Nations was established? Now when we take up this matter, United Nations was established in the year 1945. And what we call as the treaty was signed on 26th of June 1945 and it came into force in the month of October, October 24th. Now, during the course of war, the Second World War began. During the course of World Second World War itself, there was a move to have an international organ. Now, when I speak about the move to have an international organ, hostess, remember both Winston Churchill as well as, as, well as President Roosevelt on in a, in a boat on a vessel in the Atlantic. So, in the mid-Atlantic Ocean in a vessel, in the month of, in the year of, in the year 1940 itself, they declared themselves as United Nations. In one of the speeches that was made by President Roosevelt, Roosevelt pointed out, there are three, uh, there are four rights which are at peril today. And the members of the international community have to restore these four rights. And the responsibility is completely with them in restoring these four rights. Now we may be interested to know which are these four rights. Now one is freedom to worship God. Freedom to worship his God is in danger because Adolf Hitler have killed ruthlessly the Jews. Because these Jews were worshipping a type of God which he was not prepared to accept. Freedom to worship God. Freedom from fear. Freedom from want and freedom for the press. These were the four rights which are in danger and the international community should restore it soon. Remember, this statement was made in 1940, January 6th. But on January 1st, 1941, the members who participated in a conference declared themselves as the future United Nations. And these members who participated in the establishment of United Nations were called as the original members. That means the idea of United Nations began as early as 1940 and it was accepted in on January 1st, 1941 itself. Thereafterwards, remember it could not come because the war was in full swing at that time. 
the united nations in order to be drafted the future united nations had to be in writing and for for this purpose state conferences or the members were interested were invited and they used to participate and discuss along with the allied powers and these allied powers were responsible in convening such conferences now when i speak about this there were the conferences began in 1943 it is called the moscow conference it was convened by the state of soviet russia the most moscow conference discussed the threat bear how the future united nations shall be and what exactly are its functions how we should exercise its powers so after the moscow declaration of 1943 there was another conference that has taken place in 1943 itself uh, 1943 itself at tehran and they also there are also many issues relating to the future united nations and its organs were discussed and the result was the dumbleton oaks proposal which came in in the year 1944 so the what was discussed in 1943 at moscow as well as tehran were resulted in the form of a document and this document was refined perfected at dumbleton oaks so the dumbleton oaks became the main document and along with this remember in the year 1945 they met at yalta all the members met at yalta and finalized the future united nations and it was accepted in 1945 january 26 and it came into force remember in the year uh, 1945 january uh, uh, october 24th now the most important thing is as pointed out professor bavet an authority and a practicing lawyer before the international court of justice who is in this book Uh, international law points out the failure of the league of nations did not destroy the conviction shared by many that only an international institution which is going to be established in future will serve the succeeding generations from the scourge of war and that is how the united nations came in and if you look to the charter of united nations and the charter principle the charter of the united nations begins with the stirring words we the peoples of the united nations twice in our generation have suffered from the scourge of war now when i speak about we the peoples of the united nations the united nations not merely speaks for states but it speaks peoples of the world so it speaks for the peoples of the world this is one important aspect now other thing is when we speak about the united nations the united nations speaks about the equal protection of rights of states of nations large and small and the essential rights of the peoples of the world equal rights of states equal rights of men and women of nations large and small so this is what is being spoken there under the charter of the united nations now the other thing is you may be interested to know what exactly are the objectives of the united nations now the objectives of the united nations essentially are three the first objective that is being spoken under the auspices of the united nations happen to be the maintenance of international peace and security twice remember in our generation we have seen war what it can cause a great writer points out war like gunpowder only destroys it cannot build hendrik van loon in one of his write the story of mankind in his writings points out war like gunpowder only destroys it cannot build and that is why peace is very much essential maintenance of international peace and security was given priority and for the maintenance of international peace and security they thought of establishing an organ and the organ was established so one of the objectives is to maintain international peace and security now the second important objective is to promote international cooperation between states there shall be cooperation and po- cooperation leads to pro- leads to progress progress leads to pro- prosperity and definitely the very objective is to attain prosperity between states with service nationals of each state 
Now the third important objective of the United Nations is to promote the protection of human rights. And without discrimination of race, religion, sex and place of birth. So human rights is considered as one of the objectives that is being spoken under the Charter of United Nations. Now having discussed this much, we go to discuss something relating to Article 2. Article 2 of the Charter basically envisages the principles on which the Charter is supposed, supposed to function. When I speak about this, you see, the Charter of the United Nations is based on the participation of member states. And when I speak about the participation, it is a multilateral treaty. And to this multilateral treaty, the states have given assent, they have ratified through their municipal constitutional law. For instance, if India ratifies, it has ratified under Article 253 of the Constitution, read with Article 51c. Now, in circumstances such as this, when a state ratified this treaty, naturally it is supposed to carry out its obligation to its full spirit, in full spirit, to the full extent. Now, the Article 2, Paragraph 1, what it says? The Article 2, Paragraph 1 of the Charter of the United Nations points out, the Charter of the United Nations is based on the principle of sovereign equality of states. When I speak about the sovereign equality of states, now certain states may be small, certain states may be big, certain states may be huge. Now you take the instance, the state, the instance of the state of uh, the island of Nauru, or the state of Singapore, or the state of Bahrain. They are small states compared to the state of United States, the state of Soviet Russia, as well as the other, other, the state of the People's Republic of China. They are huge, but then these are tiny states but still sovereign states, they function, they are admitted as members of the international community. And both the state of the United States, the state of Soviet Russia, as well as the People's Republic of China and the other small states have only one vote before the General Assembly of the United Nations. When I speak about one word, naturally you should know, it is essential to know that it is dependent upon the sovereign equality of states under international law. Now the second principle that is being spoken under Article 2, Paragraph 2, members of the United Nations who are parties to the United Nations are supposed to carry out their treaty obligations faithfully and in good faith. Suppose for example, a particular state like India signs many treaties. And when one signs international treaties, it is the duty of the state of India to carry out faithfully and good faith, in good faith, the treaty obligations to which the state of India is party. Similarly, it is applicable to all the members of the United Nations. Now there is another article, Article 2, Paragraph 3. Article Paragraph 3 of Article 2, what does it say? All the members of the United Nations have to resolve their disputes peacefully under the United Nations system. So no state is supposed to endanger or act in, a such, in a such a way wherein international peace and security is put in danger. So all of them have to recourse to peace and a peaceful settlement of disputes in accordance with the prevailing rules of international law and the Charter of the United Nations. Now, Article 2, Paragraph 4 of the Charter of the United Nations points out, no state shall threaten the territorial integrity and sovereignty of another state. A state is not supposed to threaten the territorial integrity and the sovereignty of another state, come what may. Now, if it threatens, remember, it is a violation of the basic principle of the Charter of the United Nations. All states should live peacefully in accordance with the purposes and the principles of the Charter of the United Nations. Then we go to Article 2, Paragraph 5 of the Charter. When we speak about Article 2, Paragraph 5 of the Charter of the United Nations, if the United Nations makes a request, make a request to give assistance from a particular state, all the members of the United Nations are supposed to adhere to the request and give them any form of assistance, assistance in any form by the concerned state to the maintenance of international peace and security. 
So in the event of a request, all states should come together and help for the promotion, maintenance and restoration of international peace and security is the other mess, other provision is one of the purposes of the Charter of United Nations. Now the other article is an important article, Article 2, Paragraph 6. Now Article 2, Paragraph 6 speaks about the universal character of the Charter of United Nations. When it speaks about the universal character of the Charter of the United Nations, even non-members of the United Nations are supposed to act in accordance with the purposes and the principles of the Charter. No state uh, which is not a member of the United Nations, just because it is not a member of the United Nations, can take law into its own hand. Nor it can violate, the, the violate or threaten the maintenance of international peace and security. Even non-members who are not members of the United Nations are supposed to act in accordance with the principles and purposes of the United Nations. That is why the Charter is universal in nature. Now the other important article happened to be Article 2, Paragraph 7. Article 2, Paragraph 7 of the Charter of the United Nations points out, the nothing contained in the present Charter permits the United Nations to enter in the domestic jurisdiction of a particular state. What does it mean? The provisions may be plenty. There are as many as 110 articles of the United Nations. All those these provisions speak about the United Nations and its functioning and the functioning of its organs. United Nations cannot, remember, interfere in domestic matters of a particular state, domestic jurisdiction of a particular state, and disturb them. Only it can in interfere if there is a violation of international peace and security and enforcement action under chapter 7. Otherwise, it cannot. These are the basic purposes of the United Nations. Now, having said this much, we just go to discuss the organs of the United Nations. When I speak about the organs of the United Nations, there are six principal organs of the United Nations. Now, the first one, the first organ is the Security Council, which is an executive organ. The second one is the General Assembly of the United Nations. The third one is the Economic and Social Council of the United Nations. Now the fourth one is the Trusteeships Council of the United Nations. The fifth one is the Secretariat. And the sixth one is the International Court of Justice. These are the principal organs of the United Nations. Now today, we take up the first organ of the United Nations, that is the Security Council. Now, when we take up the Security Council, let me just speak to you, Article 3 of the Security of the Charter of United Nations. Under Article 3 of the, the, of the Charter of United Nations, the Security Council is composed of five permanent members. Now, you will be interested to know, permanent members, they are permanent members, they will be, they are, they were, and they will be the permanent members. They are the firm, five permanent members. Now, when I speak about this, why this permanent membership? Remember, because some scholars go to the extent of pointing out, considering the big five as the five, or the big five as the only five, and the big five as the lasting five, adds two things into the charter. One, it adds a static element to the charter. The big five are the five, and they will remain five even tomorrow, and the day after, and the years ahead. So that is why the charter has a static element. And the other one is the big five that you speak today, there are more powerful states than the big five. But then, they are considered as the big five for the simple reason. They are the ones who are responsible in concluding the Second World War. They are the ones who played an instrumental role in defeating the state of Japan, the state of Germany and to a certain extent, the state of Italy, Germany, Italy and Japan were defeated by the allied victorious powers. That is why, since they were responsible in concluding the Second World War, the state of United States, the state of France, the state of United Kingdom, the state of Soviet Russia were, and the People's Republic of China were given what we call as the important place as members of Security Council. Otherwise, remember, this, the entire the Charter of United Nations is dependent upon the sovereign equality of states. The very inclusion 
of these five permanent members as permanent members forever. Remember, it is questionable for the simple reason because under Article 2.1 of the Charter of United Nations, we say the Charter is based on the principle of sovereign equality. Now, this is essential because they were the ones who were responsible in concluding the war. And hence, but for these people, the Charter of the United Nations also would not have come. And the effort is praiseworthy. That is why they are called as the permanent members. Now, after this, the five permanent members, then you have ten non-permanent members now. Earlier it was seven. And in the amendment that has taken place in 1961 and 63, the seven members were increased to nine members. So, uh, ten members. Now, ten non-permanent, not nine. Ten non-permanent members you have. Now, ten non-permanent members are elected by the General Assembly of the United Nations with a two-thirds majority. Now, when I speak about the ten non-permanent members before they are elected, now two criteria are being put. Now, one is the contribution of that state which is interested in fighting the election to become a non-permanent member. Now, what is that? The first one is what contribution it has made to the maintenance of international peace and security. So, such a state should have spoken of peace and security and championed the cause of peace and security, contributed to the cause of peace and maintenance of international peace and security and such a state is eligible to contest and if it gets two-thirds majority, can member become a member of the Security Council. Now, the office is for a period of two years. So, all the ten of them are elected for a period of two years. To keep the seniority and the association, the United Nations have formed, formed out a rule. Every five members are elected a year. And if they elect five members this year and another five will be selected next year. This is to keep the seniority and remember to encourage the, the debate and other important things. Now, you might be knowing the other day, India was elected as a non-permanent member of the Security Council. Now, having discussed this, uh, we go to the other important developments. So, one is Security Council is composed of uh, ten uh, non-permanent members and five permanent members. So, the five of them have are, are five are five because of the differential of powers as Professor Jesu, the professor of Harvard Law School points out. They were the ones who were responsible in concluding the war. Then now we go to the other important development that is the Article 5 and 6. When I speak about Article 5 and 6 of the Charter of the United Nations, suppose for example, a particular state against whom action is initiated by the Security Council. And when action is initiated by the Security Council, especially enforcement action, naturally its membership will be suspended. Now, the Article 6 points out, a member uh, against whom for violating international peace and security, uh, consistently violates the basic purposes charter. So, when the member violates consistently the basic purposes charter of United Nations, naturally such member will be, will be remember, eliminated or expelled from the United Nations. So, Security Council's decision is very important. Recommendation of the General Assembly will be accepted and such member is considered as expelled. Now, the Charter of the United Nations uh, before I speak to you, uh, the Security Council, I wanted to speak to you one more issue. The Charter of the United Nations does not speak, provide for withdrawal. It does not provide for denunciation. It does not provide for reservation. It is the most important aspect. Withdrawal, suppose for example, when once you ratify the treaty and become a member of the United Nations, you cannot withdraw from the United Nations. It is not allowed. Denunciation. No, it is not allowed. You cannot denounce the United Nations Charter. Then thereafter, no reservation is per permitted because in other multilateral treaties, a concerned state may reserve and the expression of reservation may be done to one or two articles of the treaty. That can be done, but here it is not done. But then, a member can withdraw 
by fulfilling its obligations to the Charter of United Nations. When I speak about this, suppose for example, a particular state feels, feels that no, no purpose is going to be served by remaining a member of the United Nations. And if it feels that on fulfilling its obligations under Article 19 of the Charter, especially the financial commitments, it need not go and it consider itself as withdrawn from the United Nations. In the history of United Nations, we have only one, one illustration, that is the state of Indonesia. Indonesia in the 19, uh, late 1950s uh, thought no purpose is going to be served by remaining a member of the United Nations and hence it withdrew. But then the very next year it joined the United Nations. Suppose for example you are a member of the United Nations means you get a lot of free assistance and free help and it is sent in the ordinary course of nature without restriction. And all of them, all of them remember get stopped and when they stopped you don't get and you don't receive anything. Indonesia realized the pulse of the problem and rejoined the very next year. This is something. Now with which we go to discuss something relating to voting procedure before the Security Council. When I speak about the voting procedure, Article 27 of the Charter of United Nations speaks about the voting procedure. Now Article paragraph, Article 27 paragraph 1 points out each member of the Security Council shall have one vote. Oh, each member of the Security Council shall have one vote. And then it goes on to say in the remaining paras, a procedural matter naturally will require the consent of nine members. Earlier it was seven, consent of nine members. Now when I speak about procedural matters, it requires the consent of nine members, any nine members. Whether the five permanent members support or not, that is immaterial. Now you are interested to know, what is this procedural matter? Wherein you require the consent of nine members, wherein whether the permanent members support or not is totally immaterial. Now they are all, generally speaking, remember, uh, uh, small matters, not matters relating to the maintenance of international peace and security. No one is regarding the one, maybe, uh, if you look to the procedure of the United Nations, there are certain things which are being spoken. Uh, the, uh, you, one can come to know by looking to the procedural practice. One thing is uh, putting the item into the agenda of the Security Council meeting. This is a procedural matter. What items can be put? And there are certain procedures that are to be put there. Now the second one is adjournment of meetings. How the meetings are to be adjourned, at what modalities are to be adopted before the adjournment of the meeting. Now this is a procedural matter. Now giving uh, an invitation to a party to participate in the meeting of the Security Council, this is a procedural matter. And the procedures are being established under the Security Council. That is why in these type of procedural matting, matters, or it may be related to agenda, calling of a meeting, then what we call as the postponing the meeting and the other issues, you require the consent of nine members only, whether the other big five support or not is immaterial. Now the third paragraph goes to the extent of pointing out, on all other matters, on all other matters, remember the support of nine members is required including the big five. That means smart. That is, one is procedural, that is a preliminary question. The second one is non-procedural. In all non-procedural matters, you require the consent of big five. Now, when I speak about non-procedural matters, you know naturally that these non-procedural matters are matters relating to the maintenance of international peace and security in most of the cases. And the Security Council here is given the power of veto. There are certain uh, issues which came before the Security Council, wherein a particular, uh, in a particular issue or in a situation, the Security Council wants the matter to be decided, whether it is a preliminary question, that means whether it is a preliminary procedural matter or a non-procedural matter. So there are certain doubts whether it should be treated as procedural or non-procedural. 
And if it is non-procedural, the consent of the big five states are very much essential. Now what will happen is, if a state which is interested in preventing it, first it will come in the meeting and cast its veto. And thereafterwards, when the matter is decided as non-procedural, it will come up for de debate and discussion. And at the debate and discussion, it will cast its veto and see that no decision is taken by the Security Council. So, veto is being cast at two stages. At one stage, whether to decide a matter, whether it is procedural or non-procedural. And when the matter is decided as non-procedural, it will see to it that a veto is cast with the result of no decision is taken by the Security Council. This is generally called as double veto. And this double veto power which is given to the Security Council, remember in the formative periods, especially between 1945 to 1990, has given so much of trouble. Now, the Charter of United Nations has no defect. But then these defective members are administering the Security Council. When these defective members are administering the Security Council, they see to it that vote is cast to decide the preliminary question. And when it is treated as the main question which comes out for a meeting, they will cast their veto. Now look to the, the performance of Security Council all through. When you look to the performance of Security Council when it exercised its powers, now first we go to discuss the powers which he exercised by the Security Council under Chapter 6 of the Charter. Now under Chapter 6 of the Charter, the Security Council, remember, is supposed to follow the traditional modes of settlement of disputes. Now when I speak about the traditional modes of settlement of disputes, what is this traditional modes of settlement of disputes? Now the first one is the mediation, persuasion, negotiation, arbitration and these are the traditional modes of settlement of disputes. Judicial settlement as a rule has to be referred by the Security Council to the International Court of Justice. The Security Council has played an important role in a series of cases. For example, in the Corfu Channel case, the Security Council passed a resolution saying that the matter is a legal question. There are several legal questions which are involved in the case and hence it should be referred to the ICJ. But there are other matters, remember, which has to be decided, which has to be decided and resolved through peaceful settlement of disputes, which is called as pacific settlement of disputes under chapter 6. Now, for example, who can go before the Security Council to seek justice? When I speak about who can go before the Security Council, the first one is the General Assembly. The General Assembly of the United Nations can refer a matter to the Security Council for its resolution. Now the second important thing is the uh, Secretary General of the United Nations. The Secretary General of the United Nations can refer a particular matter to the Security Council for resolution. Now the third one is non-members of the United Nations. Non-members who are not members of the United Nations can also refer the matter for a resolution of the Security Council. And even members, members of the United Nations can also go before the uh, Security Council provided, remember, if it is mooted through the General Assembly, then the idea will be good. Otherwise, outrightly, it will be rejected. Now, when I speak about these are the parties who go before the Security Council for a decision. Now, the Security Council, when it takes up the matter, just because you have submitted the issue before the Security Council, will it take up the issue? The first fundamental thing is the Security Council is concerned only with the issues relating to the maintenance of international peace and security. You might be knowing the primary task of maintaining international peace and security rests with the Security Council. And only primary task is rests with the Security Council of the United Nations. Now when the matter is referred, the Security Council may find out and say, we are not going to accept this matter because these are not international matters or these matters are going to threaten international peace and security. 
Since they are not going to threaten international peace and security, resolve yourself, don't come here and waste our time. This is one. Then, they, then they, it may advise the parties. And when we speak about international peace and security, remember, it will not interfere in the domestic jurisdiction of a state. And in, having advised this, the Security Council uh, may accept or may cease the dispute. When they cease the dispute, they call upon parties to, remember, put forth their viewpoints. Now the Security Council, just because the parties have put forth their points, will relay on, on this. Or whether the Security Council has the power to make investigation independently of its own. Suppose, for example, take it this way, take State A and Z have gone before the Security Council for resolution. They have a dispute. And when they have gone there, the Security Council may say, these are all not international matters, nor they are going to violate international peace and security, nor they are threatening the violation of international peace and security. Settle yourself, don't come here. Now, in case, it accepts, and when it accepts, it will call upon the parties and to submit their version. And when they submit their version, the Security Council is independent to conduct an investigation by itself. Or it, may, or it may request an organization of the United Nations to conduct the investigation. For example, you have the Human Rights Committee. And the Human Rights Committee may be asked to investigate and submit a report. Or it may uh, request some other organization, the Secretary of the United Nations, to make an inquiry and submit a report. And when it gets the report, it will call upon the parties and then it will refer a particular mode of settlement. And it may say, there are certain issues relating to oh, the dispute which have to be settled by arbitration. Or it may be by negotiation. Or it may be by mediation. Or it may be by conciliation. And it may say one of the uh, modes and say it has to be done. But there are instances wherein the Security Council assumes a quasi-judicial role. And when it assumes a quasi-judicial role, it may remember decide by itself and dispose the case. It authorizes the power and disposes the case by itself independently, wherein the quasi-judicial power is exercised by it. Now, when I speak about Chapter 6, the Charter of United Nations is all between Article 33, 34, 35, 36. 34, 35, 36, the, art, the article speaks about what we call as the Pacific Settlement of International Disputes. So, wherein the Security Council is independently competent to get the information by conducting or making an analysis, an inquiry by itself or through the agencies of the United Nations and write a report or refer the parties to take up one of the modes of settlement of disputes. Now, with which we go to, about, go to discuss something relating to Chapter 7 of the Charter. Now, Chapter 7 of the Charter of United Nations speaks about Article 38, Article 39, 40, 41, 42, 43, 47, up to 46. Enforcement action. When I speak about enforcement action, suppose for example, in a particular place, in a, a place of the world, a situation, in a, in a situation, peace and security has been violated. And there was a lot, lot of complaint, which is being addressed to the Security Council. The Security Council takes up the matter. Having taken up the matter, it intends to resolve the matter. Under Article 39 of the, of the, of the Security the Charter of United Nations, the Security Council is empowered to decide on three important things. The Security Council decides on behalf of the United Nations whether a threat to the peace, whether a breach of peace or an act of aggression has taken place. So the matter pertaining to a threat to the peace, breach of peace or an aggression has taken place or not will be decided by the Security Council under Article 39. Now there is a slight difference between the League Council and the Security Council. In the League Council I just made, I have told you other uh, before, that each member had the competence to decide whether a threat to the peace or a breach of peace or an act of aggression has taken place. But here collectively all the 15 members on behalf of the United Nations sit and decide 
whether a threat to the peace or breach of peace or an act of aggression has taken place. Now, if that is done, remember, when this is being done, if you suppose, for example, in a particular situation, the Security Council comes to the decision or takes a decision that there is a threat to the peace, breach of peace or an act of aggression. Then comes Article 40 of the Charter. Under Article 40 of the Charter of the United Nations, remember the Security Council is empowered to take provisional measures, temporary measures against that state to see that the concerned state is subdued and tries to accept and maintain international peace and security. Now, if these provisional measures are not there, under Article 41, you have what we call as uh, economic measures. This is the, the, it may uh, stop giving any aid, no communication link, all of them will be stopped. Both what we call as the transit passage by air, by sea, uh, as well as by land will be stopped once and once for all. This is economic sanction. To see that the concerned state is humbled, humiliated and towed to the line of peace and restores peace and security. So, this is economic sanctions. Then Article 42 of the Charter of United Nations speaks about what we call as enforcement action. When all these measures are not suited or suitable, the Security Council will prefer Article 42 of the Charter of United Nations to maintain peace and security, that is to enforcement action. That remains what? The Security Council decides to take an action under Article 42, that is enforcement action through the armed forces of the United Nations. Now you might be knowing again under Article 46, you have 43, uh, 43 and 46, you have the Arms Committee which is being uh, constituted by the United Nations and there should be a meeting and it will decide and then enforcement action will take place. Now, one important point which you should remember, in all these cases, the Security Council, when it takes a decision, the consent of the big five members are very much essential. It is a non-procedural matter and the vote is non-procedural. And for the non-procedural vote, as I mentioned to you earlier, you require the consent of the big five. Without the consent of the big five, nothing can move, nothing can happen. That is why the Security Council has not been able to function uh, very effectively. Now you take certain instances, when I speak about the instances, instances that have taken place in the year 1950. When I speak about the instances of 1950, North Korea invaded South Korea and when North Korea invaded South Korea, the matter came before the Security Council of the United Nations, the United Nations, especially the United States, under the auspices of the United Nations, wanted to take an action. And remember, initially, they agreed and took an action. And this action was taken by the Security Council. And this action was taken by the Security Council at the absence of the state of Soviet Russia as well as Poland. Soviet Russia abstained from the meeting, it did not. In the absence of Soviet Russia, the, the, the measures were taken. And later, when the measures were taken, it came and challenged the legality of the Charter of United Nations. How you can take a decision without me? I am a permanent member. You cannot take a decision without my presence. How did it take place? Now, at that time, remember, members of the international community questioned the attitude of the state of Soviet Russia. Under Article 28 of the Charter of the United Nations, the, the, the member of the Security Council is supposed to be at the headquarters of the United Nations all the 24 hours. The Security Council is a continually functioning body. And a meeting can be called at any time, even the early hours or midnight. In situations like this, naturally, everyone is supposed to be present at the headquarters of the United Nations. Uh, this was, uh, see, Article 28 points out, the Security Council shall be, shall be organized as to be able to function continuously. Each member of the Security Council shall, for this purpose, be represented at all times 
at the seat of the organization. This is what Article 28 of the Charter of United Nations points out. And they questioned it. Members of the international community, members of the United Nations questioned. Under Article 28, you are supposed to be there at the headquarters of the United Nations. The meeting may be called at any time. And when the meeting is called, you are supposed to represent yourself. Why you have absented? And afterwards, after coming out now, not attending, you are questioning the legality. First and foremost, you should know for what purpose the organization is established. It is established with a noble purpose of maintaining international peace and security. Because war, like gunpowder, only destroys and kill. It, and it doesn't know how to restore peace. Now, this was the attitude the, of the state of Soviet Russia in those days. I can just tell you, in the first 25 years, there were many, as many as vetoes cast, and of which, remember, nearing 75 vetoes were cast by the state of uh, Soviet Russia. Now, the East-West rivalry. East-West rivalry was, had reached such a zenith, wherein Soviet Russia was always used to cast the vote, so that no decision was taken uh, uh, by the Security Council. Now, there are two other instances which I just intend to give you. And one instance happened to be the Congo crisis of 1960. In the Congo crisis of 1960, remember there appeared to be unanimity in the beginning. And when it, there appeared to be unanimity in the beginning in 1960, especially on July 14th, July 22nd and uh, August uh, 8th. Three resolutions were passed by the Security Council. This was in 1960. And remember, these resolutions were passed and they were provisional measures and it was about to be implemented to uh, resolve the Congo crisis. And thereafterwards, remember, both the state of Soviet Russia and Poland appeared before the Security Council and challenged its legality. And when it challenged its legality, remember, for the first time, the Security Council took the decision of establishing United Nations uh, Peace Force. Uh, uh, so, United Nations Peace Force was established. Uh, this is Emergency Force as well as Peace Force. United, UNE of United Nations Emergency Force is called as uh, United Nations Peacekeeping Force was established in the year 1960. Then uh, we come to what we all call the Rhodesian Crisis. In the Rhodesian Crisis, there were certain instances in the Security Council and there appeared to be unanimity. And when it appeared to be unanimity, all the members of the United Nations, uh, together especially the Security Council, took a decision. And then a resolution was passed unanimously in the year 1966, one in April and the second one in uh, two resolutions in April and the third resolution uh, 1966 in the month of December and decision came in. There afterwards what happened, happened was there also it was enforcement action, not provisional measures. And here also remember the state of Soviet Russia later challenged. In circumstances like, that, like this, a great professor, professor of international law points out, that is Professor Bavet, the Security Council lacks the teeth with which to bite because of the veto. Remember, it is not able to bite properly and to restore maintenance of peace and security much as against its will. Because under the Charter of United Nations, it is pointed out, each member should decide by itself. It has the power whether action has to be enacted. When it supports, the decision is taken by the Security Council jointly. This was uh, another. Now the failure of this, you take a number of instances, I can speak to you, the Algerian crisis, the Moroccan crisis, the Indo-Pakistan crisis. You have hundreds of instances earlier and you have hundreds of instances after 1990. But then, the Security Council was not in a position to function effectively because of the veto. Now, the failure of the, the Security Council has resulted in major, three major developments. You may be interested to know. When I speak about the failure of the uh, Security Council has resulted in three major developments. The first development is the emergence of General Assembly as a superpower. 
Now the security is supposed to act. If it is not acting properly as required under the Charter of United Nations, especially under Article uh, 24 and 25 of the Charter of United Nations, naturally there will be another organ. Another organ has also has the power to maintain international peace and security under Article 10 and 11 of the Charter of United Nations. It can discuss, General Assembly can discuss any question within the scope of the present charter. It has a role in maintaining international peace and security. Here is an organ which was established exclusively for the maintenance of international, maintenance of international peace and security, but it fails due to its attitude to take a decision in a particular case. At that time, naturally, the agenda from the table of the Security Council will pass on to the General Assembly. Now, the second important development happened with the, the establishment of what we call as NATO Regional Security Forces as well as Warsaw to maintain, uh, remember, the sovereignty of India, sovereignty and independent of each state. NATO represents the democratic forces and Warsaw collective security mechanism represents and protects the communist forces. That is how regional security establishments were established. This was not expected. This came in at a later stage. Now, there was another major development that is being spoken. That is, uh, regional uh, uh, organizations. The powerful regional organizations came to be established, the, the, especially in Europe. The European system, the European Union came to be established. The Council of Europe came to be established and which was not expected or conceived because they thought that at the regional level we have to maintain peace and restore peace at ourselves. That is how these three developments took place. I just uh, wanted to speak to you one or two important uh, what we call as the developments that have taken place uh, between 1945 and 1990. Now, uh, during the uh, course of certain debates, both in the Security Council and the General Assembly, members who are parties to the disputes used to walk out in protest. Now, for example, I can just say the South African issue. In the South African issue relating to apartheid when the matter was discussed in the Security Council and the General Assembly, the state of South Africa or the South African representatives walked out in protest. And it said, you cannot take this matter seriously and it cannot be considered. Now, simultaneously, when the Rhodesian matter was discussed, the state of Great Britain walked out in protest. And simultaneously, the state of Spain, remember, when a decision and the discussion took place that it should be debarred from membership of certain organizations in the United Nations, it walked out in protest. Now, there are, it may be Algerian question or the Moroccan question or other issues relating to uh, India, Pakistan. So, the states responsible walked out in protest. In situations of this type, at a later stage, there emerged three important principles, three or four. Now, one is discussion of a particular matter does not tantamount to intervention. Discussion or discussing a particular issue is not intervention in the internal affairs of a particular state by the United Nations. It has the power to discuss and it can discuss and it is empowered to take a decision or leave it then and there. This is one development that has taken place under the auspices of the United Nations. Then a colonial question, remember, is not a question which comes or falls within the domestic matter. A colonial question naturally is an inter international matter which has to be decided and determined by the United Nations. That is why all colonies became independent. The matter pertaining to self-determination is not an internal matter or a domestic matter. Under no circumstances, remember, you can say that it is a domestic matter. Now, because it is self-determination, then naturally, you know, self-determination has to be facilitated and felicitated by the United Nations under several resolutions which were adopted by it. Thereafter, what they said, a state, when once it becomes a party to the Charter of United Nations, 
It is not supposed to say that the concerned issue is domestic. All international issues connected to international peace and security are naturally within the purview of the Charter of United Nations. That has to be remembered. So with which we have completed uh, the, the evolution, development, establishment of League of Nations, failure of the League of Nations, the Charter of United Nations and the powers and the functions of the Security Council. Thank you.